Welcome to PR After Hours, your twice weekly cocktail of business, PR, and marketing tips hosted by me, Alex Greenwood. Every week, we bring you virtual happy hours featuring business advice from entrepreneurs and leading thinkers in PR, marketing, and business. We're going to get started in just a moment, so stick with us. Okay, who has a podcast, then writes an ebook about podcasting and doesn't do an audiobook version of it? Well, not me. I've done that. In fact, I'm very excited to tell you, dear listeners, that the podcast option, my recent top selling ebook on podcasting, my journey through 15 years as a podcaster, broadcaster, host, guest, and observer, is now an audible audiobook. It's really, really, really exciting for me to be able to present this to you through Audible, uh, which is available on Amazon.com, where the ebook link is as well. And in this fast listen, my experience uh, comes to you through stories, practical tips and advice from my hundreds of hours as a guest, producer, podcast host, and more. And the podcast option, if I say so myself, is mandatory listening for those new to podcasting, and it should be a welcome addition to veteran podcasters library. So check out the podcast option read by yours truly, Alex Greenwood, or as they say there, the J. Alexander Greenwood, because that's my pen name. And that's a long story, which if you dig through my podcast, eventually you'll find out what that means. But the point being today, the podcast option is available now as an audible audiobook. I've got a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. Please do me a favor, go get that audiobook. Or if audiobooks aren't your bag, there's also a link for you to get it as an ebook. Again, the podcast option. I certainly hope you will choose it. Okay, so I'm watching a movie or a TV show, right? And this is not a good habit to be in, but I do this, okay? I look at it and I see an actor or an actress and I'm like, oh man, who is she? What movie have I seen? So uh, do I go to IMDb? No. I go to Wikipedia <laughs> because Wikipedia, you kind of get, I think, a little a little different take on things. IMDb seems a little more PR kind of. So I like to go to Wikipedia. That's not the only reason I go to Wikipedia, but I can assure you millions of people go there every year, which is why I'm very, very excited to welcome Rhiannon Ruff to the show today. She has more than 10 years experience helping large organizations and Fortune 100 companies navigate Wikipedia. She co-founded two boutique agencies in that time and worked with countless brands and business leaders to update their Wikipedia entries in line with the site's rules and guidelines. When she's not helping her clients or running her business, she's likely found sipping tea. You'll probably get a good clue as to why in a moment when we hear from her, walking her dogs or playing with her twin boys at the lake near her home in Ohio. Rhiannon Ruff, welcome to uh, PR After Hours. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and chat to you about Wikipedia. It sounds like you're already a fan, so I don't need to persuade you how great it is. No, not at all. I Actually, I donate too. I'll throw in a few bucks whenever uh, uh, the founder asks me to, you know? I mean, I, I use it, so why not, right? Right, right, exactly. And I think, so this is a kind of a good place to start off because I think a lot of people don't know why Wikipedia are asking them to donate. They're like, what? <laughs> What's going on here? What's happening? So um, one of the like giant misconceptions people have about Wikipedia is that it's like any of your other websites that are out there, like Reddit or Twitter or something like that, that it must be its own entity, that it has its own kind of staff and things like that. Actually, no, uh, not at all. So Wikipedia is a site that is run by the Wikimedia Foundation. They're a nonprofit. And they, all they do with Wikipedia is they look after the, the site itself. So they keep it running, they keep the servers running, they provide support. Their staff basically make sure that the site doesn't break. And they also help out the community. So here's the thing. Wikipedia is a community-led encyclopedia project. It's like if Reddit was also creating an encyclopedia. And that's the best way to think about it. Like it is, there's no staff at Wikipedia. There's no central organization. This is all just being created by these volunteer editors. And that's why the money is important because then it goes to Wikimedia Foundation. 
they can keep making sure that it loads fast for you when you have those vital like 1 a.m questions about who that actress was who was in that thing <laughs> yes exactly well let's uh let's talk. there used to be i don't hear it as much now well i do hear it occasionally though there's still people who say uh, you know, caveat mTOR about Wiki Wikipedia. I mean, if it's like you said, it's not, yeah. and I, I did know this, it was not done. There's no big building of people who do this. Um, but therefore, sometimes things that are suspect can creep into a Wikipedia profile, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's this amazing resource, but it is, it's an open source website. So, you know, the famous tagline is Wikipedia is the encyclopedia that anyone can edit. And really a central tenet of the whole site is that anyone can contribute, help to develop this, this material. But that comes with this huge vulnerability, right? If anyone can edit, anyone can edit. Yeah. Um, so anything can get added. Um, so a lot of times if folks come to us and they say, hey, I'd really like to have a Wikipedia article. I say, would do you? do you really want to? If it's an individual, it's very much different than a brand because it's very personal to you, number one. And then number two, everyone has their haters. You know, mm -hmm. you can be the most wonderful, lovely person in the world. I think what, what's that famous phrase? Like you can be like the most juicy, beautiful peach in the world, but someone hates peaches, right? <laughs> so everyone has their haters. If you have a Wikipedia article that is out there, that's going to pop right up in your search results. It's going to be there front and center for anyone who maybe has a grudge, maybe doesn't like something you did in business years ago. Maybe they don't like your politics and it can become a lightning rod for those types of things so it's definitely something that if you have one you need to keep a close eye on it all the time so something that I really try to push is like being proactive with your Wikipedia presence not in terms of trying to get in there and change things but monitoring what's going on are little changes happening over time um, is there a, a news piece coming out about you that maybe isn't so great is someone going to pick that up and try and add that in there um you know a lot of times folks don't catch things until they're too late mm -hmm. uh, we hear this a lot especially like business leaders who've really just kept their heads down they've been focused on their business they've not really been pushing their their pr too much and then one day one of their kids comes to them and says have you seen your wikipedia page this has actually come up a couple of times for us recently with clients where it's like literally the children have told their parents, like, have you seen this? This is not good. <laughs> and it's just, you know, a combination of, um, you know, things sneaking in over time and misinformation not being corrected because the general like the way that media and the digital space works is so different these days. Nothing really ever goes away anymore. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's funny because the news cycle is very short, but the memory is very long. That's exactly it. And Wikipedia is the Internet's memory. Yeah. <laughs> it's that's that's where all the things go. If it was if it's been published <laughs> in a reputable source and someone has found it interesting enough to add to Wikipedia, the likelihood that it will get removed is pretty low, especially if it has that good sourcing. Let's let me ask you a quick question. So let's see. I've written a number of books, okay, mm -hmm. uh, eight or nine books, and uh, done a few things in my life that I, that are that are somewhat, I think, you know, not maybe not Wikipedia good, but but uh, but I thought to myself, you know, maybe I want a Wikipedia page or maybe. But and I looked into it. And it's like it's not like you can just go create one. First of all, you have to pass no. through all of these, jump through all these hoops. And there's the the point I want to get to though is. Uh, I'd love it if you could talk to us a little bit about how brands and individuals, let's just real quick, the hoops they have to jump through. And then let's talk about, again, why I'm glad that I'm not nearly famous or important enough to have one of these things. Because I, like you said earlier, I really don't think I need that stress in my life. So, so what are the hoops you got to jump through just to get a page? Um, and I guess you could also, sorry, extended question. Also, tell us about brands and people who the page just generates somebody else did it and then they have no recourse to remove it yeah oh my goodness um well I'm gonna start backwards on this a little bit and tell you first of all about so I mentioned the tagline it's the encyclopedia anyone can edit 
that's actually pretty different if you have any kind of conflict of interest. So for you, you really shouldn't go and just create a page about yourself. You shouldn't just go ahead, write that up and submit it directly on Wikipedia. So you're automatically, if you have a conflict of interest, you have an extra level of hoops to jump through. If you have any kind of financial conflict of interest, so you're working on behalf of a brand, an organization, then you have an additional layer to that too. So Wikimedia Foundation um, a few years back said, hey, we got to do something about the fact that like the site has become hugely influential. A lot of people want to influence it. There are paid influencers that are going to affect it. We have to make sure that there's some way of vetting that or some rule in place that we can say, hey, we don't want you doing these certain things. So they put it into their terms of use. If you have a financial connection, you must disclose it. You have to be really specific. You have to say who you're being employed by, who you're working for, any third parties that are involved in that whole process, basically. So say I've got my Chase Bank statement on my desk right now. So say I was going to be hired by Chase Bank to go and update their Wikipedia page. I would have to say, hi, I'm Re. I work at Lumino and I'm here being paid by Chase Bank to seek some updates on this page. That's just part one of this though. Because then part two is I'm not allowed to just go in there straight away and start editing that page. Um, You know, logistically, I can. Mm -hmm. Like, there's nothing stopping me from doing that. But Wikipedia's community have themselves all these guidelines that they follow and they enforce. And they're really strict on brands and companies and anyone being paid by them not making direct changes on Wikipedia, which Mm -hmm. opens up the question, what do you do? Um, So actually, there's a whole lot of stuff that's like behind the scenes on Wikipedia. Um, There are all these talk pages that are attached to every single page on Wikipedia. They're basically like a discussion forum that's attached to every Wikipedia article. So that's where they want brands to go. So that's where I would go and make my request and say, hey, uh, Chase Banks um, CFO needs to be updated. Here's a source and here's how, how to do that. So automatically all these additional hoops for brands to do this. And then who's going to make that change for you has to be a volunteer member of the community. And they're all busy. (laughs) There's not that (laughs) many of them. They're busy writing articles about the real housewives of um, wherever um, (laughs) or their favorite Pokemon or, you know, actually really important things like keeping all of the COVID articles updated, making sure that misinformation is kept out, dealing with different political issues all across the globe. Some of them are like really involved on in some topics that are incredibly important for us to have information about. So to find the time to come along and review this, these types of requests, you are asking quite a lot. You need Mm. to make sure that those requests are easy and actionable, straightforward, um, that they are helpful and that they are all within the site's guidelines. And then you have to find someone who's going to be able to do that. You just drop it in there. It's going to take a while. So this is a big reason why having a Wikipedia page is not so great if you need to go and change something because you have to start jumping through all these hoops. You can't just go in there. So a brand gets a page created for them. They didn't ask for it. Hmm. It's just there. Things start getting added to it willy-nilly based on what people see in the news, what they they read. Maybe they see something on TV and then they start researching and they're adding things in. They're not really doing it from the perspective of like, hey, I've done, you know, I've really thought about this brand and what they've done over time. And I've put together a thoughtful history. Usually it's just kind of, individual items and it becomes really kind of messy or it can have a particular opinion depending on who it is that's editing because we all bring our own opinions and bias into things so maybe you don't like chase bank so much maybe you had a terrible time with their credit card services and so when you you see that there's a gap on wikipedia about that you go and you write something and it's kind of mean um so these are sort of things that brands are facing is that you know, you can end up with something that is not a digital property that you own and you have to approach it really carefully. So 
like I say, that monitoring piece is really important here. And also, you know, preparing to work on this as a community engagement is really important too, thinking about the volunteer community. Now to your other question, <laughs> I know that's a lot. Um, your other question was about the hoops you have to jump through just to get a page in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, if you want one, yeah. If you want, if you want one. Yeah. So some of the similar things, like obviously you can't just go ahead and create it yourself. You shouldn't do that. Um, Wikipedia editors don't like that so much. Um, there's a whole process you can go through to put forward a draft page and then volunteers review it. Um, it's called Articles for Creation. And um, before you even get to that point, you have to figure out, do you meet Wikipedia's standards? Right. Do you fit that criteria that they are looking for? If you're just a regular human, chances are you don't qualify for a Wikipedia right. article. Um, there are different types of qualification depending on what type of human you are. Are you an athlete? There's a specific set of rules for that. Um, are you an author? There's specific rules for that. So it'd have to be like, where have your books been published? Were they self-published? Were they published by a well-known publishing house? Have you had book reviews that have been published in good sources? Um, those sorts of things. Um, are you an academic? Have, has your work had like an impact on a broad scale? Um, business people have it the hardest. Yeah. Because business people are the most likely to want a Wikipedia page. So a lot of this is like supply demand. Right. And Wikipedia editors saying, like, who are these people who are trying the hardest to get a Wikipedia page sound the same? So they really tightened up the rules around that. You have to have really substantial media coverage as a business person that's focused on you, not your business. It has right. to be about you personally, your achievements. So usually we're looking at needing like four or five pieces, um, journalistic, written by you know, solid journalists in sources that are um, well known with a lot of detail about the individual before we can say confidently, yep, yeah, you qualify for a Wikipedia article. Um, for brands, it's actually even worse. Um, <laughs> companies, you need to have a, a level of substantial coverage that is really tough for newer businesses to get. And if you're an older business that just isn't super exciting you might also struggle with that too yeah. um i think there are a lot of companies out there who just like you know they're they've, they're on the stock exchange they've got thousands of employees but no one's writing big pieces about you know how the company has developed over time because who's who's going out and doing that so it can be really tricky for organizations um but yeah, Wikipedia editors are looking to see, has there been a lot of interest in this organization from not just the organization and its stakeholders, but the wider world? And the best way that they can discern that is through looking at journalistic coverage. But real quick, what's it mean uh, if you, you're, you're looking through and you find something that says this article is a stub? How does that happen? I, I presume that oh, if yeah. somebody's interested enough to generate an article... Or do some people just generate a born here, died here, and move on? Or what is that? Okay. So actually, that's a great question. Um, stub articles are when Wikipedia volunteers are like, hey, that's a topic that's interesting. It definitely looks like it qualifies for a Wikipedia article, but I don't have time to build out a full article right now. So they'll just get something started in the hopes that other people will then come along and fill it in. They mark it as a stub which basically just means like it's a starter. It needs to like get going. Um, someone else can come in and fill in more information. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, if you're a brand and you're wanting to create a page, you don't want to do that because you need to make a really solid case as to why your page, you should have a Wikipedia article and you're not going to do that by just putting forward like a brief stub about yourself. Even if your intentions are great with it, I, I think that a lot of brands wonder would this actually be the way to go? Because then they're allowing the community to fully develop the material. And it's so tough because that should be the best way, but it, it to show Wikipedia's community that there's enough material there that you do in fact qualify for a page, you're basically gonna have to write a fairly solid article to start out with. Encyclopedia Britannica, the world book encyclopedia, which I grew up 
worked with, which the most beautiful colors. And I, I mean, I wore out the letter, the, the letter A volume because of astronaut. I was a little, oh, yeah. just constantly looking Apollo <laughs> missions, all that encyclopedia publishers for centuries now, right. Have had to figure out that certain art, you know, for space reasons are going to have to remove certain things. Yeah. Right. Does Wikipedia have that problem? Do they weed out information that's no longer, you know, termed useful or valid or et cetera? Yeah, kind of. Um, so they, one of the the central tenets of Wikipedia says that there are no firm rules, which allows them to go back and revisit guidelines over time, see whether things have shifted, changed, and if they need to be more strict about stuff. So sometimes they have strengthened those, those guidelines, those criteria around what qualifies for Wikipedia and what doesn't. And then they'll go through and look for pages that don't fit and they will nominate them for deletion. And then groups of editors will take a look and say, should this be here? Should this not? Um, and if not, then it will be deleted. Is there, I, and this is an unfair question. Have you, could you think of something prominent that got deleted in, in the years you worked in this area? Oh my goodness. Um, not really. I think the stuff that tends to get deleted is things that should be deleted. So it would tend to be like smaller companies. Um, there are some really unscrupulous companies out there who will say, oh, we'll create a Wikipedia page for right, you right. and we'll get you all the press that you need to do that. And they will put out a bunch of just like terrible, like not real press coverage and then create this page and then it gets deleted. So that's a, that's a lot of the type of stuff that we see getting deleted often is just like pages that just shouldn't exist. Yeah, very good. Well, that leads me to, of course, part of my practice is crisis communications in the public relations realm when I'm not doing this fun show. And the thing about Wikipedia that, that concerns me as a practitioner is, my gosh, it's just another front uh, in yeah. particular in a crisis situation that, and, and by the way, it's a front we have almost zero control over. Well, mm -hmm. really zero control. I mean, we, we control our landing page. We control the message that gets to the media. If we're skillful enough, we can alter how the message is reported. Um, but on Wikipedia, you are at the mercy of, of these people we've discussed previously. And, and by the way, I'm not advocating doing anything unethical. I just mean though, that uh, it's like you said earlier, People who work at Wikipedia, not work, but, you know, work with Wikipedia volunteers, they often will just go by what they see in the media. Yep. And that's not always fair. Yeah. And so what, what I think happens then, and you tell me, I do the initial, my, my, my practice is we help with planning, but move that aside. Let's say that something's happened. Then it's kind of, it's, it's the janitorial work of trying to clean up the mess and try to change things and make it better you know, fix it as best we can and, and promise to do better going forward. But then we have to talk to somebody like you, I guess, uh, a little bit and get some more. So tell us about yeah. that and about Lumino and, and what PR folks should know. Yeah. So I think crisis comms is like one of those areas where you, you know this, this best, but the, the general advice about how to deal with crisis has changed a lot. You know, it used to be just kind of like, don't say anything, keep your head down, it'll go away. And now that's not the case at all. Like companies have to respond, they have to make changes. And that is super important for Wikipedia. The thing that's really tricky for Wikipedia is how to respond there in both a timely way, but also you have to have the sourcing there to back it up. So you're wanting to put in, you know, what the company's doing to resolve this issue, but Wikipedia doesn't like that. They want to say what has been done, what has happened, right. which can be really tricky. Um, the most important thing that we can bring to the table at Lumino is kind of that year to kind of listen to what all the, the issues are, what's happening on the company's side and figure out what the timing will be and what types of information are going to fit best on Wikipedia, how to approach this. And maybe there's some stuff that's ended up on Wikipedia that shouldn't be there. Maybe some of those sources that were critical um, in the moment are actually like not good sources. Maybe they come from publications that Wikipedia typically doesn't like to use. Um, you know, maybe they're super biased or they only present one perspective. Maybe they were actually some op-eds or um, contributor pieces and they were added by editors who are not super knowledgeable in the moment. So you kind of have to look at things. Every situation is going to be completely different. 
there is no blanket, like one size fits all advice on Wikipedia, which is why it's really important to go to folks like, if not us, someone else who is, who's been working on Wikipedia long enough to be able to untangle those threads, look at what editors have been involved on the page. Is it all newer editors who don't really know the rules so well? Or are these like super established editors who are admins who know exactly what they're doing and you're going to have a bigger fight on your hands if you try and go in there and seek changes? So what's going to be practical? What's actually going to work in those types of situations? Okay, fair enough. So how did you get into this? This is not a, a, this is a very niche. This is a sub niche business you're in here. I'm dying to know, how did you, Ray, how did you get into this? Well, I, I started off um, working in um, an agency that was kind of just right at the start. And we were doing a lot of different types of content work. We did all different types of things. So we were helping with putting together um, scripts for videos and we were doing um, infographics and strategy for and content for those. So we would do any of like the words and info parts of things. And one of the things that we were doing was Wikipedia. And over time, I, I gradually just kind of focused more and more on the Wikipedia stuff. And it just... And really the site has not lost any of its prominence in some ways it's gained more um, in that time so I have just kind of felt like this is the area where I can be most helpful to folks and I really feel like there's not enough people out there who are helping people to do this the right way and who are giving folks the right information so that they don't make mistakes Everything on Wikipedia is so transparent. It's so publicly visible. So if you make a misstep, everyone can see it. And that's yeah. so important for brands these days, um, especially because, you know, nothing goes away. So I, I'm always like, my general opinion is there should be more folks like me. Yeah. Um, so I hope that more people will join this weird niche and not, not the folks who are just like, I'll make you a Wikipedia page, but folks who are like, hold on a second, let's, let's take a nice slow and steady approach here. What I like is that I can now uh, call, call you for my clients who have these issues and oh, yeah. refer them to you because I do not want this headache at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you know, that's the thing too. So let, let me ask you on behalf of a lot of our PR consultants out there listening, let's say, I, you know, here I am crisis, right? And this comes up. Do you do you ever just do consults with people like me and say, here's your next move? You know, we pay yes. your, your freight for a few hours of consult. Do you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, we're, we're always happy to do that. Um, you know, even if it's just a quick call, just to kind of level set and give you like the additional voice to say, hey, we shouldn't be doing that. So I think a lot of times in those moments, you know, companies are really stressed. They want to do everything possible and just being a nice, calm voice in the room can help. And if I didn't ask this earlier, let's say that I become a bestseller and they decide to make a Wikipedia page for me. I have no control yes. over that. I cannot have it removed, right? It's it's up there, right? No, it's, it's, it's up there. If you're a public enough person to qualify and have that page created um, and there's enough material about you, it, it's up there. Um, you can make requests to fix things you know say they right, put on said, there yeah. that you know kind murdered of a man for snoring too loud yes yeah say someone added that you could go on there and say like there is no evidence for this there's no sourcing can someone remove this i, I did not murder that man for snoring it was because his feet smelled <laughs> <laughs> i love it no okay but here's that's i was going back to that i didn't know we kind of covered that earlier because i have another question though uh, that i didn't ask about that which is so can anybody sue the foundation if they feel like they've been defamed on Wikipedia? Oh, you know, this is the really clever thing about the separation here between Wikimedia Foundation and Wikipedia. So they're a lot like the way that, um, you know, Reddit and Facebook and Twitter are set up in that Wikipedia is user generated content. It's all created by uh. these individual users. So the Wikimedia Foundation has no input into the content at all. You cannot write to the foundation and say, I hate what's written about me on my Wikipedia page. Can someone there fix it? They'll say, 
you should take that to our community of editors and someone will be pleased to explain to you why not. So is that a, uh, is it section 230, is that right? Or the, the same thing that Facebook and Twitter and all social media operates under that kind of shields them. We're not publishers. We're just providing a platform, right? That's the way they get away with it. Exactly, exactly that. So yeah, so you you cut, you. I mean, you know, anyone can sue anyone, but you, you they would not be- do. You would not be successful, let's put it that way, in suing right. the Wikimedia Foundation if you had a, a, a slanderous Wikipedia page. Okay, so what I think I've heard today, Re, is that use Wikipedia and it's generally trustworthy because there's a lot of there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen to make sure that you know one bad actor doesn't ruin everything. There's generally that, but but as I always tell clients and listeners double triple check sources before you use it uh, in any way particularly for your business um, wikipedia is a nice source it can also link to other sources that are beneficial to you there's that second thing though is uh, that there are a lot of hoops to jump through so uh, be careful what you wish for if you get a page if you want a page there's just a lot to go through and Ray can tell you about that and the third thing too is just that if if your brand or your company or you get a page you're stuck with it i think that's what we're hearing here so yep. uh Rhiannon rough uh this is some rough stuff you've given us today and it's all been good <laughs> and i really appreciate it so tell us tell the listeners how do they get in touch with you uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Rhiannon Ruff on LinkedIn. That's where I am most active. Um, you can also reach out to myself and my team at shout at luminodigital.com. Very good. And fear not if you're on the treadmill or driving in your car, riding a bicycle or juggling or <laughs> mixing a drink. Do not worry. Just go to PRAfterHours.com and there will be a whole page with Ree's photo and links and, and the whole shebang just for you. And of course, it should be in the show notes on wherever you get a podcast, but some of those things get a little hinky. So just go to PRAfterHours.com and you'll find that the link will be in the show notes. Rhiannon and Ruff, thank you so much. I did not know hardly anything about Wikipedia and you have now made me feel a lot less stupid about it. And I appreciate it. And you've given me a lot also to think about. Thank you again for joining us here in the virtual lounge. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you know what that means? Looks like it's last call here at your virtual lounge for PR news views and interviews. We'll keep it short and sweet. Just remind you, if you like the show, there's many ways you can help us keep it going. Not the least among which is to rate this podcast. Simply go to the show notes at PRAfterHours.com or wherever you're getting this podcast and click on the link rate this podcast.com slash after and it will take you to apple podcasts and a couple other places very easily one click you write your review it's done can't tell you enough how important it is to get ratings on those sites so that we can build our audience and keep bringing you the kind of information you need every week for your business also don't forget if you want to sponsor the show give us a tip in the virtual tip jar or ask a question there are links in the show notes well I think it's time that I uh, cleaned up and closed up for this edition of PR After Hours here on Anchor FM. Oh, thank you.